Hi, my name is Phil Howard and I'm director of the Oxford Internet Institute. Thank you for the invitation to record a lecture for you. There's several different kinds of research I want to tell you about, but let me open up by first telling you about the Oxford Internet Institute. There are many interesting things about this department. We were started about 15 years ago and we're about a third computer scientists, a third philosophers, a third social scientists. And we were started at a time when I think the social sciences, what, what counts as the social sciences, needed to change. And Oxford's a wonderful place. It's also a very old institution. And this is one of the, one of the ways in which this university uh, got looked ahead, uh, managed to do something that was ahead of the game. Uh, our department has been particularly important for defining some of the social problems and opportunities that come from new information technologies. And my particular research group on misinformation has done a fair amount of work to, to make the, the issue of misinformation and degraded civic engagement uh, a global issue. We've studied some 40 countries now and uh, found many different ways in which bots on Twitter, fake accounts on Facebook, uh, Russian interference, many, many different sources of manipulation have come over social media. It was our research group that first found using public data uh, the misinformation that was flowing over Brexit. It was our group that documented the role of misinformation in the U.S. election in 2016, uh, in the debates between Clinton and Trump, and then before that during the primaries, and then again on into the, the um, presidential, the new presidential cycle after 2016. Our work has involved many different kinds of data. It involves uh, spending time with the businesses that sell fake social media accounts in Eastern Europe, for example. It involves analyzing large swaths of data from social media firms, from Twitter and Facebook. Uh, sometimes now we're able to get data from Instagram or WhatsApp. And these, tell a, these, these large sets of data tell a pretty comprehensive story about the kinds of misinformation that we can see out there. What's harder for us to do as a, a group of researchers is to paint a picture, to, to draw the connection between a, a campaign on social media to manipulate public life and changed voter attitudes. It's very difficult for us to link a tweet to a vote. Now that said, there are still many other things we can say about the long-term consequences of misinformation on social media. You can still measure the number of British voters who think they'll be saving 320 million pounds a week for their national health care system. You can still measure the number of U.S. voters who think that there was something going on in that pizzeria uh, outside Washington, D.C. Uh, that supposedly had Hillary Clinton embro embroiled in a pedophilia ring. Unfortunately, numbers like that tend to skew either young or old. In, in the U.K., it's a slightly older uh, I, older voters who believe uh, that kind of misinformation about Europe. In the U.S., it's younger voters who are not quite sure what the Clintons were up to who believe that kind of misinformation. But this is a long tail effect. The other kinds of things we can say about the causal story of misinformation in public life is that in some circumstances that misinformation is concentrated. So we've been able to demonstrate that misinformation about the U.S. election in 2016 was concentrated in swing states. It wasn't simply distributed uh, broadly over the entire country. Now I want to tell you about a particular kind of research we've been doing in the US context. In uh, the spring of 2017, I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post arguing that it was time for Zuckerberg to testify. It was time for Facebook to come, and the other social media firms, to come to Capitol Hill to explain what they knew about Russian interference and talk about what they had done to try to stop it. This cracked open a national conversation about having uh, the firms testify and they did this in the fall of 2017. As part of that process, the major social media firms turned over a very large, a very large collection of data about Russian interference, the, the known Russian accounts that they had identified as being managed directly from St. Petersburg. Now, at the time, the U Senate Select Committee on Intelligence decided to ask us to analyze the data. And there's three punchlines from the work we did for the Senate Intel Committee. 
They're all fairly straightforward, and for those of you who love, have a passion for politics, um, I think you'll find them quite reasonable, quite uh, understandable. The first is that the peak activities, the first punchline is that the peak of activity from Russian accounts targeting U.S. voters for misinformation, these peaks occurred naturally with peaks in the electoral calendar. When Trump won the primaries, there was a burst of Russian activity. Each night that Trump and Clinton debated, there was a burst of Russian activity. In the few days before the election, there was a burst of Russian activity from these accounts. But what was really surprising for us is that over time, over the, the multiple years in this data set, the largest volume of misinformation was not before 2016, but after 2016. The data set goes well into 2018, and it's almost as if the Russians found that they were successful or thought they were successful in their work up to 2016, and then doubled down. So that the greatest volume of content that these fake accounts produced came after election day. The second, surprise, the second punchline from our work with the Senate data is that the campaigns mounted by the Russians were not simply confined to Twitter or Facebook. There were similar trend lines in Instagram. Uh, Google, unfortunately, chose to provide its data to the Senate Intelligence Committee in PDF format. They decided not to provide it in a machine-readable format. I think this is an important footnote because it's important to remember that these technology companies collaborate in different ways with public agencies, and Google's response was not satisfactory. So we didn't play with the Google data. It was not useful for us. But the activity of the known Russian accounts has, has migrated. It's, it's somewhat on Twitter now. It's somewhat on Facebook but it's, it's extremely high levels of activity on Instagram now. We think that's because that's where most young users are. So, the Russian activity started earlier than 2016. It, it continued, uh, it bloomed after we caught them in 2016. It's traveled across platform. It's a multi-platform strategy. And the third finding that we, we offered in our testimony to the Senate is that there were some significant concentrations of cultural themes, the themes addressing cultural politics in the United States. The first and most important before 2016 involved targeting African Americans with misinformation about um, political identity, uh, with messaging encouraging African Americans to stay home. Um, white political leaders will never represent you. No need to vote. Um, protest democracy in the United States by, by not abstaining from voting this time round. Sometimes the subtle messaging there was just designed to encourage African American voters to participate, for look, to look for relief from their grievances in, in other kinds of institutions and to avoid democracy. Sometimes the voter suppression techniques were fairly specific. Um, Hillary Clinton died last night. She's not, she's not running for office. There's no point in voting for her. Or, if you're a Democrat, you can text message your vote in. Or, uh, my favorite is your vote, the voting day has moved. It's no longer Tuesday, it's now Friday. So, so vote on Friday. These kinds of messaging, again, it's very difficult to know how many people actually believe this kind of misinformation, but this content is prevalent. Uh, much of the other content dedicated to African Americans is about uh, political identity, asserting political identity. The second largest cluster of content that the Russians generated was targeted at the far right, at um, very conservative voters. And I don't mean small c conservatives, I mean the ultra right, far right, uh, extreme right voters. These are the voters who got significant volumes of misinformation about who, um, what the different political candidates were standing for in their, um, in their political campaigns. The third cluster of cultural references, um, more recent, uh, 2017, 2018, involves messaging for Latinos, Hispanics. And these are again about um, building Latino and Hispanic identity, encouraging Latinos and Hispanics to express themselves, um, and arguing that maybe US political institutions at the moment are not capable of, uh, of serving their interests. 
Now these problems, uh, these kinds of campaigns run in the US, we've seen run in many kinds of countries over the intervening years since our early work on 2016. We're also tracking these phenomena on WhatsApp. Uh, we've caught misinformation in campaigns just this year in Brazil, uh, in India, in the European Union. Uh, one of the interesting things that's changed over time is that several of the countries that have um, run democracies, run elections most recently, seem to have levels of misinformation that are much less than what the U.S. experienced. For our U.S. data, we found that there was roughly a one-to-one -one correlation of junk news to professionally produced news con content being shared over social media. So for every piece of junk news, a URL going out over Twitter or Facebook, uh, there was one professional story, a one-to-one -one ratio. In most other countries, it's, never, it's not this bad. It's uh, four pieces of professional news content for every one piece of junk. In Germany, France, the UK, it's six or seven pieces of professional news. I believe one of the things that can inoculate a public to misinformation is the presence of a strong state-backed media organization. And I don't mean a mouthpiece for the government, or, and I don't mean um, an organization that just parrot what's, parrots what the government says. Uh, I mean organizations like the BBC and CBC in Canada that have some independence, that are national broadcasters. And these broadcasters seem to create a culture of professional journalism that then private broadcasters adopt and adapt. So. My working hypothesis right now is that uh, we're past the point of industry self-regulation. The countries that actually want to do something about misinformation need to come up with some gentle nudge guidelines, set some expectations for what political parties do when they commission negative campaigns, when they go negative. These electoral agencies need to come up with clear guidelines for what is expected of the advertisers, the publishers like Facebook and Twitter, uh, social media companies that make money out of ad revenue. And there needs to be very clear guidelines on reporting what political candidates, political leaders report to public agencies about how they've spent their money. Now in the long term, I would say actually probably the, the deep threats are ahead of us, not behind us. In the next few years, I think it's safe to say that every major budget bill, every tax bill, every complex humanitarian disaster, every school shooting, every military maneuver will come with some kind of automated campaign for it or against it. Uh, each one of these issues will come with some kind of organized political misinformation for it or against it. Uh, in some cases it'll be about blaming political Islam or blaming local communities or the poor. In some cases the campaigns will be targeted at the far right. There is misinformation on the far left uh, but not very much. It's, it's mostly at the far right and it's mostly targeting ultra-conservatives. I don't think we've seen true artificial intelligence yet in the application of these social media campaigns, but that's on the horizon. If a lobbyist can figure out how to use data from your refrigerator, your smart light bulb, your, your TV, if they can figure out how to use that, combine it with social media content to create a political face that you'll respond well to, uh, or to deliver a message, uh, a speech that you'll respond well to, that lobbyist will make the expenditure. They'll, they'll release the money and experiment. So down the road, I think we're lo more likely to see AI-driven misinformation campaigns. Now the biggest threat, the most existential threat to democracy, I think is, is in undermining the role of science in public life. There are many definitions of what good democracy is, what democracy can be. My favorite is actually George W. Bush's. He said that democracy is about choosing the choosers. Now the truth in that, the, the value in that, is that democracy is a moment in which we get to elect people we think will use evidence in making their decisions. And we're starting to enter a pernicious, possibly a pernicious cycle in which we choose people to take office, people who go with their gut on key issues, who who do critical thinking and question the experts. Um, but what that actually means is not the same as critical thinking you would learn in high school or civics class or in, um, uh, in an undergrad program. It involves uh, 
questioning things even if there is consensus, even if there is evidence, and even if the technocrats have good ideas. So the long-term threat is that evidence itself will, will not have a clear role in public policy making. Experts themselves may not be listened to, and um, alternative facts may reign in how we set policy making in our democracies. That's the long-term negative trend that, that frightens me the most, and I think with a little care and some guidance and some public policy oversight, we can prevent, prevent that situation from arising. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for inviting me to participate. Please visit our website, oii.ox.ac.uk. If you have any questions, we have many exciting programs. Please send me your best students, and of course, please hire ours. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Please let me know if I can tell you any more about the research we're doing at the Oxford Internet Institute. Thank you.